Here we are again, Joseph F. Price, Joey P., and Ms. Lynn Griesmer from Tampa, Florida. I happen to be from Orlando, Florida. So today we're going to talk about porn in the family and what we can learn from a family that happened to be on TV called the Duggars and why it matters. So if you would, Lynn, say hi and introduce us to this conversation, please. Hi, before we get started, let us each give a, a one minute bio on ourselves. If no one's familiar with us, uh -huh. I'd like to say, I'd like to just uh, point out I'm the author of Porn Free, How to Decrease the Demand for Pornography. I've also written books on marriage, childbirth, uh, but I would say pornography is a very important topic that, that really grabbed me and inspired me to write a book about it. I believe pornography is the main portal, one of the main portals that take us down a path to more degradation and destruction and deviancy, if you will. And as we get into this topic today, we'll see how porn played the role into child tra sex trafficking and all these terrible sexually deviant topics in our culture. I've recently got involved in the local Tampa Bay area with two very important organizations. I would say for the last year or so I've been involved. One called buyerrehabilitationproject.org and that is an organization that actually helps men come out of being sex buyers, formerly going to strip clubs, buying porn, prostitution, so that's one wonderful organization serving many men uh, and helping them break free from that lifestyle. And another one called StopTheMovement.org, trying to eliminate sex trafficking in Tampa Bay. We are the third largest estimated city in the United States that makes money off of sex trafficking. And so these are important organizations. These are important um, uh, it's an important topic to me because where we have violation of women and children, and even men, but women and children really, really tugs at my heart and makes me do something and get involved. So thanks for having me, Joseph. This is going to be a great talk today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to your conversation. I happen to be Joseph F. Price. I'm pretty much a lifelong learner. Uh, I've been a life coach part-time probably 20 years. Uh, I've been a porn recovery coach for a couple of years. I lead men's groups uh, to help them uh, in the porn recovery. And I've done a podcast for about the last year or so. I did radio for a while. Um, that's pretty much me. I, I grow a little bit every day, grow 1% every day. That's pretty much uh, my goal. So, yeah, this is a very interesting conversation because of the fact that uh, where I sit, uh, it takes like five years for somebody to get better after they get hooked on porn. And now we get to have a conversation that hopefully will cause people to uh, intervene before someone gets hooked on porn. So yes. there you are. And so I feel that today's conversation can be helpful to parents and can be very necessary and vital to parents. So as we talk about this family and what happened and what transpired, we're not criticizing the family. We're examining the issues. And uh, I propose that it's not so far removed from what can happen in families if you do not grab that bull by the horns and address the pornography going on in your children or in your spouse before it escalates to something horrible. And in this family, we're gonna be talking about the porn habits of the 12-year-old of the boy escalated into now, he's 35 years old, a father of seven or eight children serving at least a 12-year prison sentence. And how we got to that, no human being wakes up in the morning and develops and, and goes down that path. Well, some do. But we don't want that to happen. That is just very detrimental to the family, to society, to everything. So if, if I want to um, mention that the goals of this conversation is to discuss this high profile celebrity family. As an example, what is not so far removed from what can happen. It's not so outrageous. To Joseph and I, this is not uh, brain science. Gosh, why would the guy do this and the wife take him back? 
Or why would this get shoved under the rug? And why didn't they really listen to the victim and they protected the perpetrator? Well, we know why. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. And in part of this conversation, I will have some assumptions. I will take a leap of faith. And sometimes these assumptions, though, are based on research and on a lot of the work that I've been doing for years and just knowing about pornography and the research and, and all of that. So so some of that. So you think you're going to be the only one making assumptions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who watched it. OK, so um, anyways, we're, so we'll talk about how mishandling when a porn uh, habit is found. We'll talk about the denial and we'll talk about how uh, the cover up, why would people cover up? And so we all, we all encounter varying degrees of pornography discovery in our families. And we just, again, want to emphasize very important to develop the courage and talk with your kids, even have conversations before porn gets introduced. But especially if you find out about it, don't freeze, don't fl flight, kind of fight, fight, fight for your family and for the decency in your family. So by the end of the podcast, we hope that parents will discover uh, and feel that they're comfortable to talk to their kids about porn or even their spouse to, to, to have the courage to deal with it. And I know that it's not easy, right? It's not easy. It's, mm. it's a very, it can be shocking. It's threatening. It threatens the status quo and the comfort level in your family or in your relationship. So let's talk about this family, uh, unless you have anything, any thoughts you wanted to add right now, Joseph. Um, no, no. Okay. Um, I, I think that the family itself really uh, is going to like show us a lot of things as we go through the story. So go ahead through the story. All right. So why don't you take, a, you know, seven or eight minutes and talk about the story of the Duggar family. Now, the Duggar family uh, was portrayed on a show called 19 Kids and Counting. It started at 17 Kids and Counting. They have 19, <laughs> 19 children now. Kids and counting. 19 children, pretty much one a year, a couple of sets of twins. Uh, uh, what, what I just want to stop and say for a moment is, in my work in childbirth, um, I have discovered that if you really, really let, quote unquote, God plan your family and you embrace uh, uh, attachment parenting, you might have six or seven children. And why I say that is, let's just say you get married at 22, you have your first child at 24. You might have seven, six or seven children before the woman hits uh, menopause. Because if you are breastfeeding, very important, ecological breastfeeding, and I know this deviates a little bit, but it just shows you that 19 is really, isn't it, isn't it really a lot for two parents to handle? So I'm not going to judge them saying they had too many, but by breastfeeding, by carrying your baby on a sling, maybe sleeping with your baby in a bassinet or in the bed, you know, in the middle of you, with you and carrying that baby, the woman's um, menstrual cycle will usually be delayed for a longer period of time if she's ecological breastfeeding and not using pacifiers or bottle feeding or all that. But I just want to I just want to put that out to you, because if God designed it that way, then maybe one husband and wife could handle six or seven kids when they're spaced apart a little bit. So anyways, when you look at this family, you, they look like they're super, super power, uh, 19, very attractive, well-mannered, well-behaved kids. And um, it's just a humongous family. Not only is it a large family, it's humongous. So I, I just had to deviate. Where were they located? Remember? They were located in Arkansas. Okay. Arkansas. Uh, so anyways, the Duggar family was on TLC from 2008 to 2015. And listen to some of the dates that I throw out to you and you'll see, wow, this happened at this point in time. 19 kids and counting. Josh is the oldest. He's born in 1988. So he is now 35 years old. He was convicted of possession of child pornography on his work computer in 2019 and is serving a 12 year prison sentence. I did wow. some basic research on the Duggars as I was writing my book, Porn Free. And I, a documentary was released in May titled Shiny Happy People, The Duggar Family Secrets. And this is kind of why I'm talking about this because a documentary came out and it really exposed a lot 
for what they wanted to expose or were able to expose. It exposed a lot and made me think about this family. So I watched this four-part docuseries and thought it was worthy to discuss. Now, the family presents a regimented, orderly approach to life. Here's what we can piece together about Josh, the oldest son. In 2002 to 2003, when he was 12 years old, he was caught using pornography by his parents who sent him to a church work camp for a month where he did carpentry tasks. No significant counseling was provided. And upon return, at some point after he was 14 or 15 and was discovered to have molested six or more girls, including four of his sisters, he was sent to a family friend who was a state trooper who counseled him. And what they wanted to do was not have a police report. They wanted to have him have keep the problem in a family with an official, a police person to counsel him. So no police report was filed, but a discussion with a state trooper friend ensued for a period of time. I think one session, at least one session. So the story gets darker because the state trooper was eventually convicted of child porn and he is currently serving a 56 year prison sentence. So this is the person they took their son to talk to. Okay, in 2004 to 2006, the Duggar family uh, is portrayed in a TV show and Oprah, before their series started, mm. Oprah Winfrey caught uh, wind of this family and thought, wow, they'd make great guests on their show. So she was going to interview them. But in 2006, an anonymous, someone sent an anonymous letter detailing Josh's molestations that happened before that of the sisters and other girls and Oprah canceled their appearance. In 2008 to 2015, among the TLC's uh, TV station, highest rated shows was 19 kids and counting. So there's a lot of money at stake. This, mm -hmm. this is very valuable to this, uh, this TLC. It was a re reality series about the family. Um, we know that Josh got married in 2008 and he was 20 years old. A and after he had five children, several, year several years later, after he had five children, he was caught soliciting women on the Ashley Madison website. There was a breach in security. And, and this is when a lot of this information broke loose, when he was caught on Ashley Madison. If you are not familiar with Ashley Madison website, it, the tagline on it says, life is short, have an affair. It also says monogamy is monotony. So it's a place where married people can go and think they're going to find a discreet affair with somebody, somebody else. And you pay big money for this. I, I heard that at one point Josh was paying $1,000 per month to be a member of this website for That's whatever a, lot of money. a month for whatever services he, he was uh, transacting. On the website, uh, their main graphic, oh my gosh, if you go to their website, you will see a graphic of a woman with a finger on her lips and you don't see her eyes. And she has oh. six. Now look at that. Keep it secret. Red flag, red flag to any relationship. When you are doing things wrong and you know it's a secret and you think you're getting away with something, you are not getting away with any darn thing in your life. But you people tell don't them, know this. People tell don't them again, Lynn. People they don't hear it. People don't understand it. All right. Let's see. Um, so TLC, the show was canceled in 2015 when this Ashley Madison stuff came out. Okay. After the news reported that Josh molested four of his sisters when he was 14 or 15, we also learned that he and his wife went on. He had five children at the time. The wife stayed with him, and they went on to have three more children. I'm not sure if they had a miscarriage in there. So that I'm not sure they have seven or eight, but he went on to have three more children with her. Oh, so then he put covenant eyes on all his devices to try to come clean. And then a friend called him up, a buddy called him up and said, Hey, I know how you can bypass covenant eyes. You can go onto Linux. You can get onto this laptop and no one will ever find out that you're doing it. Well, guess what? 
somehow um, our government is pretty good with the surveillance. It can find out. It can do uh, wonderful things uh, when they have to. And they found out uh, in 2019 that he had child porn. He had porn. He had downloaded a lot of images. And I believe he was convicted in 2021 and started his prison sentence in 2022. Now, the show was discontinued in 2015, but there were a few spinoffs from that. Some of the sisters shows, but I think they've all been since canceled. So that is um, a little a synopsis of the Duggar family. Their oldest child started out on porn and um, it just it escalated. It escalated. You see clips where the parents knew about it and they were lying when they were interviewed in public. I know sometimes we present, you know, we want to present the best of our families, but then supposedly a couple of the daughters were coached. A couple of the daughters went on a talk show and they kept looking at each other and they said, oh yeah, it, it wasn't a big deal. And sometimes we didn't even feel him touching us. Come on now. We all have, unless you have some kind of uh, disability or some problem, you, you can feel touch. We, we know what a touch feels like. So it's very sad that um, sweeping it under the rug, lying, misrepresenting, trying to cover it up, trying to run, not deal with it. And we can talk about, you know, why that happens in families. All right. Anything, anything to observe or, or mention at this point, Joseph? Anything you want to say or add? Wow, what a what a family! I mean, to start with, what what a family! Um, you know, I I don't know what drove them to have nineteen kids, and these are like nineteen bio kids. It's not like they adopted yes, they nineteen kids, and 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 I'm not really here to 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 beat anybody up about any kind of choice that they ever made. Mm -hmm. However, like you said, the maximum that what did you say? The maximum that six states or seven. Like, a friend yeah. of mine who did the research and was in touch with top level doctors years ago in the in the sixties and seventies about seven children, mm -hmm. about six or seven. Um, I happen to have six. There are a couple who are close in age. Oh, you made sure that number was within yours. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened. It just happened, and still, that's a lot of work for two parents. My husband was a dedicated. Uh, father and husband and he gave up some promotions so that he didn't have a lot of uh travel and a 60 plus hour a week job he was home for dinner he was involved in the kids lives with the kids so we we definitely uh spent spent time with our children and hopefully they'll say yeah we we did a lot together over the years um but anyways there is a movement called in the christian circles quiverful quiverful movement is something uh there's a biblical verse you know uh, having a quiverful and they believe that to populate the world with good christian people to oh you're talking about be fruitful and multiply be fruitful they took and that multiply okay. uh, really okay. multiply mm -hmm. so that you can multiply uh, a more christian uh world and so um, but again, uh, so that's that's what you feel that was driving, yes, it, it which in a, in a way, you know, that it, which is, you know, it, it was noble. And a lot of times things that get us in the biggest trouble are actually noble. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I'm just keeping it real. Yes. So very good point. The, the things as as someone who works with people in recovery, the things that I just wanted to just talk about. That, that popped out as you were talking about this family is we'll start with the, the age that parents should really talk to kids is lower than kids are actually talked to. That's number one. And number two, I think one of the reasons is because kids – Parents are ashamed to talk about it. And, you know, we were talking on the phone about situations with ages of 12 and such. But I forgot. I, I've heard of stuff like kindergarten kids having to be talked to because 
they're grinding on each other in the corner. Yeah, and, and now in Australia, things that they saw on uh, young children on in Australia, young boys are doing what's called barking. It's like cat calls, barking, kind of like grinding. Uh, it's because they've seen it in porn, fifth mm -hmm. and sixth grade boys and younger. And they're treating girls in the classroom like this in front of the teachers. And they're very, people are very bold nowadays. And it's very intrusive to the girls and to everybody. And uh, it's, it's, it's not just isolated. It's, it's happening more and more in groups of people. Yeah. And you know you you had brought up that the that the um, that uh, when the sister said she was touched that the parents didn't listen, and that's it. That's sure. more common than you yeah. think. People think uh -oh. that, that people think that that doesn't happen so much, but I'm hearing from talking to people that that happens a lot. Mm hmm. So let's talk about why that happens. Number one, uh, three or four reasons. The mother of the family, the woman, the mom, to me, she should be the keeper of, of the purity or the morality of the family, a woman, uh, the mother. She should be someone that the kid could feel close to and protect. So hopefully, number one, you'll feel comfortable to go tell your mom. So you tell your mom. She might not do anything about it. She might know, and gosh, I'm, I'm picturing some people I've known uh, where, where sex abuse and things were going on in the household. When the kid told the mom, the mom minimized it or she dismissed it or she said, well, just, just wear tighter clothes and stay away from your brother or whatever. So the girl didn't get, you know, here's what should happen. The girl tells her mom, the mom it should be livid and go talk to the kid and do whatever it takes to stop whatever way, you know, angry yell, you, you, you stop this from happening and you protect your child who is the victim. We must always protect the victim. So the mom, why she doesn't protect the victim, she might have a lot at stake financially in her marriage. Uh, maybe he's a good breadwinner or she's got a lot of kids and, and her life would change. Her life might change drastically and she's afraid. So financially, there might be a lot at stake. Emotionally, uh, she might not feel strong enough. Maybe the, the husband is doing porn himself and she kind of knows, but she'd rather not know. So push it. I don't, what I don't know, my life is better. So the denial and the ignoring it. So that, that can happen. That doesn't mean a mom is a loser um, it does mean that she's kind of weak because we should have something built in our DNA to protect and survive and protect the victim. You know something's wrong. You have to do something about it. But again, why people don't leave um, abusive situ situations. There's just so much at stake. It, it, your life is going to change. It's, it's very complicated. It's, it's really not that simple. We can talk about how it's simple. But well, it's let me ask you this. In, in your family... Did this come up with your children? Okay, well, first of all, no, I did not find out about porn. Um, I said in, in one of my interviews, I have two sons and four daughters, and my two sons were both into gaming. Uh, they liked going on the internet doing gaming, and I would talk to them. I found out what kinds of games they're playing. The um, There's something with the auto, what Call of Duty or auto... I don't know. There were some really, really graphic bad games that had prostitution or beating or violence. They were not allowed to do that. So they did okay. Minecraft. They did some shooting games, but it was not, uh, you know, anyway. So so it was kind of controlled where I made them in their room have their computer screen facing the door and to leave your door open. And sometimes you could shut the door, but at any time I'm able to just not, you know, knock and open and come on in and see what you're doing. But lots of times the doors left open. I knew what times they were doing the gaming. My girls didn't really go for gaming. So they, we didn't have cell phones until they were older, older than the average. Maybe they were 14 or 15, even though they were 16 and they had to pay for their cell phone monthly. So they had to get a job and they had to figure out a way to pay for it if they wanted it. So no, it didn't come up. Um, so, but, can but, I jump in just for a second? Yes. And again, this doesn't have anything to do with you. 
based right. on what you told me. But this just has to do with having this conversation have value. I believe it's about a third of the porn traffic actually goes through gaming devices. Just just yeah. so that you're Discord. aware that gaming devices Discord. are used that way. So oh, yeah. uh, continue. Yes. They, they actually, so, that's why a parent really has to be proactive and okay, just because they're watching games, it's okay. No, it might not necessarily be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Discord and all that. Uh, okay. So uh, what else happened in my family? Um, uh, oh, and I did do, two of my kids were home birthed. I did breastfeed for a long period of time for my two youngest. I did practice natural family planning and I had a chart that I would keep track of certain things and leave it on my bed nightstand. And my daughters would come in at night and we would lay on the bed and we would have conversation, let's say when they were preteens and t teenagers. And, and so they knew, oh, mom, what's this chart? So throughout their lifetime, they saw me breastfeeding a baby. I have a good marriage. They saw me hugging or kissing my husband, or we had some date nights we had when we didn't want to get a babysitter when the kids were really young. I would make a nice dinner just for the two of us with candlelight in our own home. So it was as if we were going out to dinner. And sometimes the kid would help, the kids would help. And they saw, they saw some romance. They saw us getting along. Sure, I'm strong-willed, and so is my husband. So sure, they saw arguments and disagreements. But for the most part, they saw what childbirth, what birthing was, what breastfeeding was. We homeschooled. Um, we had co family conversations a lot. Things would come up. So I think we developed a close intimacy. And oh, and one one daughter asked me, I think she was she was 19 at the time, or was she 16 or 17? She said, Mom, what would you do if I told you I was pregnant? And I go, Well, the first thing I would do is thank you for trusting me to come to me and tell me. There's a lot of people who would panic and didn't think they could tell your mom. So I would be so thank you so much that I would be the first person you would come and tell. And number two, I would ask you, you know, what are you going to do about it? Wow. You know, so, so when she asked me that question, she learned that I fully could be comfortable. She could be comfortable with me. And number two, wow, if I'm going to have sex before marriage and I'm very young, what am I going to do? She because I'm not going to say, oh, I'll raise the kid. What are we going to do? No. So it really had to make her think, wow, you know, this is major. So and you I made it, you, you really gave it back to her versus yes. it was something, because it is her. If she it does is. it, it comes with consequences and she's going to have to deal with the consequences versus where she thought it was, was her just violating you. No, it's right. violating you and it comes with consequences. And once she understood it was, it, it's a much bigger picture uh, than she yeah. thought it was. And and I think one one of the things that you demonstrated, which is converse to uh, the family that we're, we're talking about, is that there was that opening. It's okay for you to be wrong. That yes. it's safe. Yes, that it's, it's okay. okay. Yes. That 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 you don't have to feel, you don't have to feel worse. Because yeah. you're bringing it to me. Yeah. And I might have said somewhere along the line, too, I've raised six kids and I don't want to I don't want to raise any more. <laughs> so I, I might have said that because just selfishly feeling. Wow. Um, so anyway, so the conversation died out quickly. It was just kind of I don't know why. It came, I didn't ask her. Why? Why are you asking? Why did this come up? Did not want to pinpoint and, and put her into a corner. Maybe she had a friend that this happened to. Uh, I don't know. Um, so, so anyways, uh, developing intimacy within the family is very important so that when they come to you, you will protect them. You will help them. You will help them problem solve. We are teammates as a family. We're teammates as a husband and wife. We're teammates. We're, we're all on the same team trying to get to create a fully functioning family to the best of our ability. Really, you know, that's that's what we're trying to do. So that, so though there are um, what were the other reasons why uh, the, the mother herself might not want to deal with the situation because maybe she had some type of sexual trauma or abuse herself and she doesn't know how and what to do with this. So this is why those organizations out there defend young minds. 
uh, fight the new drug. They have various books recommended to various age level. They have guidance at what age, what can you talk to a five and a six year old about porn? Here is a book somebody wrote about for an eight to 10 years old about pornography. So there are many, eight, parents could just, if you're, if you're watching and you haven't had any porn uh, issue come up in your family, go to some of these websites and just look around for a few minutes and see, oh, how to talk to your 12 year old or your 14 year old. It's gonna be very different talking to kids of different ages. The more you can talk about, um, you know, what it is, cause, cause it will be shocking if, if an eight, nine, 10 year old, even 12 year old looks at pornography and what they're seeing on the screen will be shocking. So it's better to come from the parent. There might be some strange things that you will encounter. Please, you know, shut it off, look away and come to me and let's talk about it. So um, there's, there's definitely, parents are not alone in this endeavor. They're not alone. So stop for a second. Let's go back. What, what age do you think they should have the conversation and what should they do? You know, because I, I think a lot of times parents don't know what to do. So what would you want them to know what to do and at what age? So, I, I if, if, if you know, I'm going to give you two scenarios. I'm eight years old and I stumbled into porn and I'm five years old and I almost stumbled into porn. I'm not going to wait until 12 when I watch porn at 11. Like Correct. most people do, unfortunately. So both of those situations, how would you, you do got, it? First of all, you have to deal with it right away. You've got to be ready. And when a parent has to be ready, has to be comfortable. Be comfortable with your own sexuality, you, you know, your past, uh, your marriage. It, it's much better if you're comfortable with your sexuality, if you've had a very colorful past, if you've worked through it, um, confessed your sins or just worked through it with therapy or whatever level of sexuality. So we have to be comfortable with our own sexuality. And like I said, if you're building a rapport with your kids all along, you're going to just take a deep breath and you don't have to answer your child right away, but soon enough. And um, I'll give you an example of something different that I, I, I wasn't ready for, but I was. Okay. So my oldest went to kindergarten at the or first grade at the public school. It was kindergarten, I think. And then we homeschooled after that because I just did my research and our family just happened to go down that path of preferring the homeschool model of education for many of my kids for various years. So my oldest son, Rob, comes home uh, kindergarten. So was he maybe six, five, six years old? He was waiting at the bus stop. And one of the uh, a boy, a year older, named Matt, said something about AIDS. Oh, be careful. You can catch AIDS. And so, my, so Rob came home and he said, Mom, Matt said I can get AIDS. What's AIDS? So he, here he was, a five, six-year-old. And I said, well, there's two ways you can catch AIDS. Number one do um number one is using drugs drugs is something people take a needle and they inject into their arm and if they share needles after doing drugs they maybe can get contagious and catch aids and number two and i just kind of held my breath and i just said it boyfriends being friends with boyfriends and and that's all i said and that probably would have been a shock for him but I had to say it because that's the facts. When you're talking to your child, try to present all of the facts that you know that will help them at an age level that maybe they can understand. And wait for them to do follow-up questions. Don't get too over-explanatory with a five, six, seven-year-old. You don't have to. So I just said basically two things. Needle sharing, doing illegal drugs, and that you inject. And he knew nothing about that. You know, what, do you, what is that? And a boyfriend having a boyfriend. And I go, do you, do you have any of that? Is that in your life? Oh, no. And okay. So he ran off and he went to play. So it was a topic I did not want to bring up. I didn't really want to talk to a six-year-old. That's not part of his life. But another kid on a bus stop was talking about the fear of AIDS. So this would have been 1993, I think. Somewhere around there, my kid was five or six. So that's the best I knew how to deal with it. 
And um, whether that was good or not or whatever, I that's what it was. So parents, And again, like, times are different today. Yeah. What would you tell a modern mom, the modern mom today who, you know, it's a different time. They went through COVID. Different things happened with their kids through COVID. What, what would you tell them? It also has to do with what your beliefs are, too. So you're, you're going to come at this from what your beliefs, maybe mm -hmm. what your political or your medical beliefs are. So just do the best you can. And what was your scenario? Your eight-year-old. Yeah, um, like what would you, like if you found that your eight-year-old had, had watched porn, what, what would you do? Okay, so first I would find out to what, sort of to what extent. Yeah. Oh, you know, well, what what did you see or where where was it? I try to find him to describe what it was we're talking about, like how, how long was he exposed or for how much? Who did he, where did he get it from? Did he find the father's <laughs> cell phone and start looking around? Uh, was he at a friend's house? So find out the circumstances of where. But you really, really want to get at the feelings. Well, how did you feel about this? Was Isn't that, that's weird. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, that is shocking. I'm sorry you had to see that. And then I probably would say, we live in a very um, strange world that there are some bad pictures out there. There's beauty in the world, in nature, but there are really, there are some very harmful and destructive. And then I would, I, it depends on how, how I, I really take the cues from my kid and how to make him him or her feel comfortable in the moment. It's funny, I'm assuming it's a boy. Isn't that weird? I'm assuming it's a little boy coming to you. But anyways, try to make the kid feel comfortable. Do not negate the feelings. Find out what the feelings are and how are they distraught? Are they confused? Oh my gosh, what is it that I saw doing? Uh, so it just depends on what the what you feel, intuitively feel, don't have an agenda. What are you feeling in the moment that the kid is communicating to you and is ready to hear? Because you really don't want to give too much information at an advanced level because you might confuse your kid even more. You might add to his... his well, um, let me ask you this because here's what I'm trying to get to. It makes okay. sense that as a parent that they're prepared for this conversation way before it hits them. Yes, yes. or yes? Yes, definitely. And uh, what was it that you you said something that that caused me to think as well? I forgot what it was that you said. When when, go ahead. I, 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 uh, I don't know. But... So so the feelings, what the kid is feeling, you just really have to, and you'll sense when your kid is okay, and they'll go back to playing their eight year old or seven year old little playing with their Legos or whatever. But um, would you encourage them to 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 tell you when they saw those types of images, where they saw these types of images every time, in the yes, future a, to leave when they see these types right, of images? A closing, a closing point would be, thank you for telling me about that. I'm sorry you saw it. And please tell me if it happens again. And I I want uh, I agree that it's shocking and um you don't say not you can trust me or I want you to have someone you can go to. You should not deal with this alone. And um, and then the parent might have to then get into another situation or what if it's your really good friend down the street and they were watching porn for 10 solid minutes. Uh, yes, you need to confront the parent down the street that your kid was at their house and there was some porn going on. You, you have, you need to confront this stuff festers in secrecy, and then it it uh, we parents are the adults, so we we need to be strong and we need to uh, be assertive on these matters. Now, also, um, what about the kid making the, not making the kid wrong? Um, For seeing something, I would I would end up then I would I end up doing a learning situation. So like when I, when I moved here to Tampa from Northern Virginia, I immediately saw so many strip, strip bars, yeah, strip, places, yeah. strip bars, mm -hmm. uh, taverns. There's a lot of alcohol drinking. Didn't see a lot of this in Northern Virginia in, in the wealthy uh, professional sub, subdivisions and communities. You, you didn't see it. I guess you had to drive somewhere else to go find it. So here I'm driving my 12 year old son 
down a main street and there were like three or four of them on our drive. And oh, as well as seeing billboards for plastic surgery with very chesty women popping out of their tops and, uh, you know, a, a young, attractive doctor with a stethoscope. Oh, you know, cosmetic surgery or augmentation, blah, 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 blah. So right when we moved here, I decided to point out the strip joints and the billboards. So I take it as a learning. I go, oh, Mikey, I'm so sorry you have to see that. These are strip bars, exotic uh, women, naked dancing, men, you know, maybe uh, having dollar bills or whatever. And I go, we don't do that. That's wrong. And, and I, so I kind of tell them it's wrong. It's not a good choice in so many words. But and I mean, after they did it, see, again, after, I know it's wrong to tell them it's wrong before they did it, but after they did it, it's... After they did it, it was a mistake. Okay, okay. so you, the, the cases you presented to me were it's a mistake. Okay. If they continue to go on and if they intentionally do it, I don't think I would punish my kid. I would have educational talks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, how does this make you feel? Is this how you think we should be treating women? And do you think this is bringing men and women happiness? Well, and then I, you would have to say, well, what is sex? Sexuality belongs in a marriage. I believe it belongs in, within a married couple. Um, Dad and I are very happy. We do not choose other partners outside of marriage. We so so I take it and I use an educational um, uh, thing. And so my values might be different from other parents. There might be other parents who might not necessarily think that sex belongs in marriage, that we lived together 10 years before we got married. Uh, you were born before we even got married. So it just depends who it's coming from. But I, I'm definitely more of, you could say, the, um, the conservative marital um, you know, get married, have kids. Uh, now, even though maybe that I didn't do these things, but I, this that's is where model. you are. That's, this that's is the model we're point. presenting to our children. We, we all grow and develop and the model, what you're presenting to the children, I hope you're living it. It's easier to live something and communicate it to your child. Now, from an imaginary perspective, if you were a parent today, not you, but from an imaginary perspective, using some of the knowledge that you have, you can, you, you can use the knowledge you have. What would you suggest a parent do if all of a sudden they knew nothing about this problem? That the parent and they found out anything? that their, porn, their kid was viewing porn. So answer that one the best. Okay, maybe the parent has to learn alongside the kid. Wow, I'm not familiar with this, but let's learn together what what it is you saw and if you have no knowledge of it and you know nothing about it the parent on their own time can go do a little research online oh at what age does a kid come across porn typically oh uh, so the parent could then on their own time start learning and get educated in this and that's great now now you have to educate yourself all right so now that I've asked you all of those questions uh, from um, from a perspective of, so I'm I'm in the recovery side of things. Okay. Why don't you drill me a little bit and ask right. me? Because so, this is when you drill me, what's actually going to happen is we're actually talking about what we're talking about preventing. Right. Right. The first half of this conversation was about what and how we're talking about preventing something. Right. And so preventing. now let's now it's happening. Talk, so talk now, for a moment about what we're preventing. Okay. So, so let's get back to this family that we're discussing, the mm -hmm. Duggars. Okay. So 2002, the kid is 12 years old. He's found doing porn. Now, uh, then he molested the girl. He molested the girl's. Three, four, 2005 or six. This is before the show even started. So uh, recovery. Okay. Um, I, I guess, well, I have a bunch of questions about recovery. Mm -hmm. Maybe what, what would be a good plan of action for Josh when he was 12, and then maybe they didn't do it. Now he's 14 or 15. They had another opportunity to intervene and do something. 
to me, that was the point when he physically molested the kids. If they were too weak or they didn't, they claim they tried to do a few things and they did try a few things with him. And he molests when he puts a hand. When you're touching somebody, that's a whole new level. Now that is showing me that porn is still alive and well for you to even have the nerve and, and, and the freedom in your home to be feeling up your kids. He Supposedly he had a little kid on the lap and he was feeling her up and he would go into the bedroom at night with the daughters. Okay, so that's really when it should be stopped because what happened was he gets married. He actually goes and gets prostitutes. That's the next level. Then he's doing child porn and he's, he's now in prison. So I really think in recovery, when the molestation happened, I would like to have seen the girls find some uh, neighbor, some other relative, aunt, uncle, cousin, where they can tell on the brother because the parents didn't do much. Again, too much at stake for a, a, a 12, 13, 14-year-old girl. And she might not know what to do. But I really would love the children to find somebody who they can go to who will take action. So the point in recovery, it, it, you know, you're going down this path. You've got to stop it. And maybe my one question for you is um, what, uh, when is something too far gone? Uh, it would take too much to unravel. I don't know if I'm really even asking. No, questions. well, you know, it's but, never too far gone. I mean, people think it's too far gone. It, yeah. I, I don't think it's ever too far gone. It's too far gone when a person doesn't give up. This is really never too far gone if you embrace it. But I think what you said was uh, at the age of 12, uh, you said the first time it came up, it should have been intervened. That's, you know, that from a recovery perspective, that's when it should have been intervened. But also what I'm telling you as a parent, okay, so if I got that many kids and then I, this came up, the second question I'm asking, the second, the, 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 the million dollar question is something, but the $2 million question is where else is this kind of thing going on or where else might this kind of thing be getting ready to sprout? Cause that, that's like a flower. Okay. In my family that's happened. Okay. So I know that, but where else is this happening? That's a question that you have to ask as well. Whenever you see that one breakdown in the one kid, you, they, they came out of this environment. So where else in this environment might there be something to foster that in another kid? Yeah. Um, that, 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 that's the, you know, the kind of thing that I think about in recovery. The second thing is, is get it at 12, because if you don't get it at 12, then really to, to, to work a recovery, it takes a few years. It takes three and five years for somebody to work a recovery. So it's better off not to, to, to let them get involved in the first place rather than to have it go by in secret for and all these parents years. don't think it's going to escalate. Yeah. Nobody thinks that it's going to escalate, but it will escalate. We know dopamine, the nature of how porn grabs you in, it, it, it takes you... It will take you to child uh, sex trafficking. I just saw a movie, um, The S Sound of Freedom, and the movie was only about uh, international child sex trafficking, a particular case. And not one word was brought up about pornography or it just showed the story of, of a, um, uh, gosh, uh, uh, when they captured, when they, I, I can't even think of the basic word, whatever, when they, uh, they, re they rescued, it was a okay. story about rescue. And, uh, to, to get to that point of a man in a van with a little kid that he's going to go have a weekend with a five or six year old, that is not normal. We need to start using words abnormal. That is abnormal. It's unacceptable. It's criminal. It's, it's one of the worst crimes of humanity on a child. It's, it's one, of, one of the worst crimes in humanity, in my opinion. Well, there's a couple of things also that I do want to introduce in this conversation that I've learned from a recovery perspective. But it's not just from a recovery perspective. 
those kids that are doing the abuse, like we're worried about our kids. You know, if I have a girl and I'm worried about her being abused, you know, I'm trying to keep her from the bad uncle or the bad guy at the place and this and that and the other. I I just want to point out that I believe half of the uh, childhood sexual abuse, that's not done by adults. That's done by kids on kids. And it's the kids on kids that is fueled by porn. Mm. Now, you had brought up girls. Girls do represent the fastest growing segment of porn users. And girls represent approximately 29% of the porn users. So they they definitely do consume. Um, and then there's a couple problems when girls consume porn because it's not some benign thing. Uh, you'll see it. There's a lady named Marianne Layton from University of Pennsylvania. You might can find her work, but she talks about how when women have been exposed to porn, they're exposed to, how should I say it, not non-gentlemanly like behavior. So what happens is they get immune to non-gentlemanly like behavior. So because of that, they don't have red flags like other women have. And because they don't have red flags, they don't respond. And because they don't respond, that makes them more susceptible to sexual abuses. And they actually are more higher victims of sex abuse when women are exposed to porn, girls are exposed to porn. So it, it, it does affect women and it does affect girls. And it's important to have the talk with girls, too, because it's not just girls. And the thing also with this whole porn thing that I often think about being a, a Christian man, but being a Christian man that hasn't always lived a Christian life. Um, and, you know, I drove a cab for years. I've been on I, at midnight, so I, I know the real world. I know what people are doing. <laughs> what out city? There. What city were you? What you know, you brought it up. Actually, probably one of those cities where you were. I I I started out in Springfield. I worked for Fairfax Yellow. Worked over there on the other side oh. of the Potomac River for Barwood as well. Okay. Wow. So um. Then you, of course, caused me to lose what it was I was I'm getting sorry. ready to say. <laughs> All in that, but no, I, I, I've seen some of the ugliness that 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 people do out there, and you caused me to lose my train I'm of thought. Sorry. But that's okay; it'll, it'll come back to me. What was I saying? Girls recover. Yeah. So, so there you go. Um. Yeah. Maybe it'll come back to you. Just yeah. All right. So an another recovery. What would I like to know about recovery? Yesterday in our in a conversation we were having, you said that it's not easy to give up your porn habit because it might take it's hard work and it might take you five years. A man who has been you said a guy, usually a man who has been doing twenty five hundred to seventy five hundred hours of porn it could take him five years to sort of fully or recover to normalcy. And a lot of people are impulsive. They want, they're impulsive with the porn habit, just like losing weight. It took you many years to gain the weight. If you don't see that you're losing in two months, you might give up. It might take a whole year to get to a place you want to be. So along the recovery, uh, you know, how long does it take? How long have you been using and equal to how long it might take a guy? Well, I, I think, you know, when, and, and this is this is, again, why a person is probably be better off not doing porn in the first place, because, uh, you know, we talked about it might take three to five years. There's no telling how long it's, it might take. And and then you said, somebody said, you know, that I said people use porn 2,500 hours. Yeah, if, if you use porn like two two hours a day, you know, th every day, 365 days a week, you know, 365 days a year, you know, that's like 700 hours in a year. And then you, mul <laughs> you multiply that from age 12 to 22, you know, that's 7,000 hours. Yeah, that's 10 years. Mm. Just in 10 years, age 12 to 22. Wow. What if the person is 32 or 42? 
Yeah. And, and you're not just probably not just going to be looking at porn. I just don't think you can have without wanting it to escalate to something more, finding a real person, uh, taking more risks. I don't, I, I don't think a guy or person can just look at porn and masturbate for all that. They're going to start getting new ideas. It's going to escalate. It escalated for Josh Duggar. It escalated. It, it will, it will escalate. I mean, people need to understand this. You start getting into the habit of it. You're going to, you're going to, and I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of guys, uh, they were looking at gay porn and they're like, what am I look? What am I doing? I'm heterosexual, but I'm, I'm attracted to looking at gay porn. And they slapped himself in the head and then started realizing I got to stop this habit because this is not me. This is not, who am I? You know? Yeah. yeah, and 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 that's what's uh, also interesting that you brought that up. It does escalate. It escalated in in this situation. It escalates because of it's a shock. All right. So whenever there's a shock, we want to escalate it. If we were driving cars, you know, we escalate it. I got an electric trick bike right and at first i uh, know this is all i want but you know really if i could have more power i'd want more power mm -hmm. and then yeah. if i could have more power i'd want more power so it definitely escalates mm -hmm. and what is escalation escalation can be like our friend alan textira where it becomes where people actually go out there and buy sex buyers it starts mm -hmm. with porn and then it becomes something else and then they actually get addicted to buying sex buyers or something else or something else or something else addicted to affairs like somebody in, you know, without mention in anybody's name. Uh, I think they play golf or something like that. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, that was you take a look at all of yeah. the pictures. It's those kinds of, the of 20 things. women of the 20 women he stepped out on his wife with 19 to me look like they had. They were pornified women with plastic surgery, the big lips, the big chest, and, and only one woman looked normal. Like she didn't have, I'm like, oh, she's attractive. She looks, uh, you're looking at her face and she looked normal. But Which yeah. brings me to the point I also wanted to drop that extensive porn use does is it changes a person's sexual template. Oh, And that's why, that's why what you just finished saying is valid and then that's why they 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 continue to to look at gay porn mm -hmm. yes and then they're gonna maybe maybe want to you uh, just took the words out of my mouth because it's not a maybe okay it's not a maybe. it ain't a maybe All right. it ain't a maybe i've talked to people wow. You know, there's people, you've heard that term download. There's people that could show up there. And there's people you know wouldn't show up there. Mm -hmm. But then people in them group that wouldn't show up there, if they get to watching too much porn, they end up showing up there. Mm -hmm. There's a, it, I, I actually did a podcast on this or, or a short or something. Porn's making people gay. Wow. Because they're getting fascinated with looking at men's penis and ain't got no business looking at men's penis. Wow. You know, I used to I used to laugh and talk to people. Porn gives you the 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 opportunity to see more more women in five minutes than your entire linen saw in their entire lifetime. Yeah. It's, it's, OK, well, you know what? It also gives you the opportunity to see that many men. There's something and wrong with that. Compare yourself. You're There's something wrong with that. Yeah. yeah. All that goofiness. All that yeah. goofiness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so wives should be alarmed if you have a husband doing porn and you know it and you're not addressing it. Uh, you need you need to be scared out of your pants that your husband might go down the path and go call up Ashley Madison. And before you know it, you're shocked that he's caught. You have a couple of nice kids. At well, home. that's an example of the ex escalation at, at Ashley, Ashley Madison. And another thing that lacks in porn use users that's showing up in this Josh character is they don't have, they, they lose the ability to connect with people. So they connect with screens. Yes. So instead of Tinder, he's going to connect with Ashley Madison because he doesn't have the ability to connect 
with a human being. In fact, one of the things I help people to tell people right off the bat to do to help reverse this process is, although dating websites may be very positive for people in various ways, they're not positive to you because you need to learn how to connect. And you need not to sit there and go from fantasizing on a porn site to fantasizing on a dating site. So, no. Good. Meet people in real life the old-fashioned way. Don't text. Talk in person. Go meet for coffee. Put, pick up the phone. But again, it's a whole new way of learning for these men uh, if they haven't been relating to people that way. It's a lot of their image. They have to wipe away their image, get a little more authentic. Uh, be, normalize themselves and uh, some people I think give up on it have you found people in recovery that have just given up on themselves uh, because they feel they're so far gone no they they usually give up before then I mean okay. and, and that's in their conversation usually all it takes like when what happens is like this is this is some addiction you do off to the side in your own little closet and then you get all trapped and then you, you oh I want to stop and you can't figure out how to stop. Mm -hmm. Then you start making a bunch if you're married you start making oh I can do this and you start and then you can't do it and then you start lying and then you're confused. I mean if you're lucky enough to go on the internet and seek some real tangible resources then they can help you begin the process from step by step, okay. you know, A through Z. But what happens is that's the last thing that people do. Yeah. Because yeah. they they want reward like that. So why are they going to sit here and listen to boring Joe or boring Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to listen through some stuff to get to some stuff when when somebody's telling you things. So no, they don't they don't do that. They just and a lot of people they just want want the results and after a couple of times of doing that then they figure out okay there's more to this okay. and then when I tell them look you got to fix how you're behaving you got to like rewire yourself because you've been rewired wrong you got to rewire yourself back it takes some time you got to heal yourself because you're you're wounded and the thing about this particular ailment is that it catches a certain person. It catches, it catches the person who feels that they're not getting enough attention. Mm -hmm. It catches the person who is in a, in a, in a, in an environment that's very strict, sometimes just the opposite as well, but a strict environment and a kid that doesn't feel like they're getting the attention that they wanted. And I, on the side, have been trying to figure out what was it I missed thing. And I finally figured out, yeah, this porn thing, this is the good boy sin. It's the what? The, the good, good boy, boy sin. Oh. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. The bad boys, they do bad. the drugs. They do all that. They do this, oh. that, 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 that. They do this. They go out and do that, 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 that. that. Oh, I like that. This That's is the good boy sin. You see, see what the devil was trying to do to me. That's why he made me forget about that when I was mouthing off about my driving in D.C. But now this is the good boy. This is, oh, I, I'm, I'm not having sex with girls. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing drugs. Uh -huh. I don't drink. Yeah. Okay. So this is why it is so important. For parents, not to, you know, not to just not address this. It has to be addressed. And especially in a well-managed, good, if you think you got a good boy, then you really need to deal with this because this is the good boy sin. Mm. This is what I'm finding. I'm not finding a lot of the, a lot. it's not these bad boys. Mm. There, it's not these bad boys. It's not. Oh, I got this. I've been drinking. I mean, you know, you get a little. They're they're in the mix. Yeah. But for the most part, no. A lot of these guys, they're good guys. Wow. They're good in every possible way in their life. Mm. Yeah. So you need to be conscious about. Yeah, this is the good boy sin. That is that is so true. That is remarkable. That is great. And another, you said one million dollar question, two million dollar question. 
for me, the $1 million question is, how can we break the cycle in the, in the family, generational? Because hurt people, people who were abused, don't know how to handle it. It happens in their family, and then it might happen in the next family. Maybe it takes marrying a spouse. You know, when you marry a spouse, maybe that can make a change. But how to stop generational sex abuse? Do you, have you thought about that? Well, I mean, I think to, to some degree that you, you just finished talking about it. Number one, people becoming equally yoked. And so what happens is a broken person marries a broken person and then they bear a broken person who manifests into a more broken person. How do you break the cycle? The, the best thing that you can do is like, if you got a problem, acknowledge it and go on about your business on, and working on it. Mm -hmm. See, do any of your kids have it? If they do have a problem, work on it. Yeah. Before they have a problem, you know, some of the things that we talked about and not even what we talked, we only began the conversation. There's a whole, you know, fight the new drug. There's a whole, there's, there's like, this is, this is for, as a parent, uh, and, and I also, I'm familiar with the series. This is like, to, to be equipped as a parent, this is like a 20, 40, 60 hour job, really, to be able to equip, to equip yourself as a parent to deal with this properly. That's a 60 hour job. I'm just being real. Absolutely. And better to, Better to do it even before you have kids or when you're yeah. when your kid's a baby. It starts from birth. It doesn't start, when should we have the talk on the birds and the bees? It, it should evolve. I, I felt like in my family, I wanted it to evolve by example and, and loving your child, accepting your child, just feeling comfortable with yourself and having your kid be able to come to you with anything on their mind. And I don't like the word punishment and and discipline i i want to be a teammate with my kid as i help them learn so that they can mature and go out into the world and realize and in my book i talk about uh i asked all of my six kids and my youngest was 18 at the time uh, to i don't know 32 or whatever i asked them when did you first discover porn how long and if so did you use it whatever and four of my kids and I won't say who, for when they, when they immediately saw porn or whatever, uh, they immediately looked away. It's stupid. It's weird. It's not right. They knew what sexuality was probably because I was trying to prime them in the, in the example that they grew up in. Two of my other kids uh, did look at porn for a period of time, and then they stopped. So we, we are a lucky family not to have had any of our kids uh, be affected by it, but they are affected because they, the friends, you know, why, why aren't some of my young adult daughters meeting any good guys? I mean, I think porn is so much more prevalent in our culture. People are not into marriage as they were say 30 years ago. And it's, I think it's a tougher landscape out there. And so anyway, so although porn might not affect us personally, it does have a fallout into in the whole community, in the workplace, and in the community. So, it does, it does, yeah. and, and and you know, people. I think I talked about this last time. I'm not the statistic man, but um, most porn use is done when people are, are at work I doing think a lot of it. their version of nine to five. I don't know how that works, but some kind of way that works. That's uh, mm -hmm. what the data in porn in traffic mm -hmm. occurs, wow. except for when uh, school's out. Or COVID, it goes up. Think, it goes up. It goes it, up. It went it up when people yeah, have yeah, more yeah. time, when yeah. more time to yeah. Uh, yeah. fiddle yeah. around on their phone and look up. at things. So, anything All else right. before we bore our audience? I, I, I no, hope that I we've been able to to give them something. Uh, to make a difference because it really comes down to action and it comes down to, you know, don't take this for granted. Don't think that this is something in somebody else's family. 
you know, this is something that could catch anybody's family. If it catches your family, you're not wrong. You're not a bad person. We live in a highly sexualized world. There's no need for any shame because this is this sexual addiction and all the sexual ills that people act out in their behaviors. Uh, they're fueled by shame. Yeah. So when the more that we do to, to add shame to people when they try to to deal with matters, all we're doing is making it worse. So right. there's no need to make people bad. Yeah. This could happen to anybody. Yeah. And and if you if a daughter a, a girl or a sister in the family is a victim, please be bold and tell someone who will take action, who will believe you, who will listen to you, and develop a family unit and know. Uh, visit your aunts and uncles and your cousins. Develop personal relationships so that you feel you can help each other out, talk to each other. Someone can go to you and, and be comfortable. Develop an environment of comfort. And I agree with everything you said. Yeah, that's that's probably where, where they can feel safe. I mean, safe. you know, to, 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 yes. to bring things. That's that's what's really important uh, on all fronts. Yes. So. All right. Thank, thank you I, very much. Yeah, uh, it, it was a great. pleasure talking with you, and it was a pleasure talking about this situation that seems to plague so many different families, and and it does destroy families. I mean, that's that's the worst part about it is that it it does destroy families, and um, which causes it to repeat itself. So. Anything that we can do, one family at a time. Um, so I hope that we enlighten one family. And if we did, then it mattered that we were here. All right. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you. All right. Bye.